Now, welcome to the broadcast. My name is Tony Muga. You also know me as Patrick Penry. I have a WordPress blog, and I have a YouTube site, and occasionally I'm known to do a show on blog talk, and I try to use free media because when you do, you can express yourself to the fullest without having any kind of reservations, and that's important to me, and, and that's why I'm basically on my own, uh, doing my own thing by myself right now. Now, tonight I want to dig right in and give you some background uh, because many may not be familiar with what Operation Mockingbird is, in particular with the mainstream. Uh, many of you who are searching the alternative media for answers to your questions are already somewhat aware that something's not right with the mainstream. And, and you know that these uh, spokespeople on ABC News and NBC and CBS, they they have people to answer to, and they're tightly controlled what they can and can't say. So many people are aware of that, but they're not aware of the Operation Mockingbird, which is an actual effort to uh, place operatives within the media who will represent the uh, establishment viewpoint, if I can put it that way. So what I want to do very briefly, or to begin with, is read a selection from an article on a website called whatreallyhappened.com, which incidentally did carry one of my original articles. And this is from an article by Alex Constantine. And this is a selection from this article. It's not the entire article, but I'm reading pertinent sections. And the name of the article is The Depraved Spies and Moguls of the CIA's Operation Mockingbird by Alex Constantine. So reading from the article. Operation Mockingbird was conceived in the late 1940s, the most frigid period of the Cold War when the CIA began a systematic infiltration of the corporate media, a process that often included direct takeover of major news outlets. And real quick, I'll point out, I often tell people about how ABC was bought out by Bill Casey and Ronald Reagan to quash a report by Peter Jennings on CIA drug money laundering in Hawaii. And thereafter, according to the article I read, they were been known as the CIA News Network. So there's a great example of where they go in and make a direct takeover of the entire outlet. They control and own it. They have controlling interest of shares in the stock. In this instance, it was Bill Casey. I, I think his shares dropped 6 or $7 a share, which is pretty phenomenal. And so because of the battle between Capital Cities and ABC News, the stock dropped and they got an even cheaper deal. And in the end, they have control over what is said or is not said on ABC News. Now, continuing along. In this period, the American intelligence services competed with communist activities abroad to influence European labor unions. With or without the cooperation of local governments, Frank Wisner, an undercover State Department official assigned to the Foreign Service, rounded up students abroad to enter the Cold War underground of covert operations on behalf of his Office of Policy Coordination. Philip Graham, a graduate of the Army Intelligence School in Harrisburg, PA, then publisher of the Washington Post, was taken under Wisner's wing to direct the program code named Operation Mockingbird. By the early 1950s, writes former Village Voice reporter Deborah Davis and Catherine the Great, which, by the way, is available on Amazon. I looked it up today. And uh, the book apparently does go into this infiltration into the mainstream media to some degree. Uh, I read briefly where copies were originally bought up and burned and destroyed, but the, the author, I uh, can't remember her name, uh, there it is right there, Deborah Davis, she won a lawsuit and the book was printed again, so something to look into. Uh, Village Voice reported Deborah Davis and Catherine the Great. Quote, Wisner owned respected members of the New York Times, Newsweek, CBS, and other communication vehicles, plus stringers, four to six hundred in all, according to a former CIA analyst, end quote. The network was overseen by Alan Dulles. You guys are familiar with him. I think he also oversaw the Kennedy um, Commission and the Kennedy assassination. Overseen by Alan Dulles, a Templar for German and American corporations who wanted their points of view represented in the public print. And that's very well said, because that is the objective of the Operation Mockingbird and the infiltration into all forms of media is to control the information. And by controlling information, you thus control the viewpoints of the public at large. If you 
only allow the public to know certain things, well, by logic, they can only form certain opinions based on what they are, or more aptly, not told. In the case in my instance, what I'm saying is they're not talking about a specific issue that is, in fact, a very, very serious issue. So that is the objective, is to control the flow of information. All right? And it's all about energy control on this planet. But to control energy on planet Earth, you first have to control information. To have a lock energy monopoly, you first have to control the information. Because the last thing you want is people to find out you're monopolizing the source of power, sources of power, and metering them out at top dollar as opposed to allowing alternative forms like solar energy. And a lot of people don't know patents are being suppressed. And there's major alternative energy and new energy sources that are being suppressed. So that's the point, control information. Back to the article. Early Mockingbird influenced 25 newspapers and wire agencies consenting to act as organs of CIA propaganda. Many of these were already run by men with reactionary views, among them William Paley, CBS, C.D. Jackson from Fortune, Henry Lucy or Luce from Time, and Arthur Hayes Sulzberger from the New York Times. That's a familiar name to many people. Activists curious about the workings of Mockingbird have, been, have since been appalled to find in FOIA documents, Freedom of Information documents, the agents boasting in CIA office memos of their pride in having placed, quote unquote, important assets inside every major news publication in the country. It was not until 1982 that the agency openly admitted that reporters on the CIA payroll have acted as case officers to agents in the field. In other words, when a journalist is out in the field doing his reporting, one of the CIA agents is his handler, and he will instruct him on what he can and can't report on. And this is really in a nutshell, you can see this in the movie Full Metal Jacket in the Vietnam War where the guy, Private Joker, he's writing for the Stars and Stripes, and that is indeed the case there. His boss basically tells him, you know, there's some things you can and can't write about when trying to win a war. You may have to exaggerate, you may have to out and out lie, but you have to keep morale up to win the war. So basically the same premise there. In the 1950s, outlays for global propaganda climbed to a full third of the CIA's covert operations budget. Some 3,000 salaried and contract CIA employees were eventually engaged in propaganda efforts. The cost of disinforming the world, the world cost American taxpayers an estimated $265 million a year by 1978, a budget larger than the combined expenditures of routers, UPI, and the AP news syndicates. In 1977, the Copley News Service admitted it worked closely with the intelligence services. In fact, 23 employees were full-time employees of the agency. Most consumers of the corporate media were and are unaware of the effect that the salting of public opinion has on their own beliefs. A network anchorman in time of national crisis is an instrument of psychological warfare in the mockingbird media. He is a creature from the national security sector's chamber of horrors. For this reason, consumers of the corporate press have reason to examine their basic beliefs about government and life in the parallel universe of these United States. And that's basically the summation of what I wanted to read from that article, courtesy of what really happened. Now, why is Plume Gate a big deal? This is what we're going to, second part we're going to talk about tonight, is Plume Gate and why is it a big deal? Why is what is contained in NRC FOIA documents so critical and important? Why is it now that it's so, you know, maybe too late now, we're three weeks away from election? But had the system worked properly, had the alternative media function to its capacity, what you would have seen was uh, an effect much like probably during the Iran-Contra or Watergate within the mainstream media, because even in those instances, there is a lot of publicity, a lot of press, and, and you know, there's a, a lot of attention drawn to those two particular events. When you look at Plumegate, and by comparison, Fast and Furious, I, I like to say it was the approved conspiracy this year that we got to, well, you got Joe Arpaio talking about the birth certificate, but you know, one of the others was the approved conspiracy was a Fast and Furious. And it is damage mitigation, in my opinion, where the lesser of the two is allowed to leak and the most damning evidence is hidden, hopefully, until the election is over and Obama can get 
and get back into office. And it's all theatrics, but the main thing is they want it to look legitimate to the American public, right? And if a big boondoggle of a thing comes up that hampers that effort, well, it makes the, the theatrics and the rigging of the election that much more difficult. So it's very important in that um, it happened on Obama's watch, and it's certainly indicative, if nothing else, of a president who's having a, you know, one of three things is going on. He's either lied and conspired to by everybody around him, right? and, they, and they tell him, hey, there's nothing to worry about. You go out and tell the American public it's fine. No radiation is going to hit America. We have nothing to worry about. That's possibility one. Everybody around him is lying to him. And this is, this is not unheard of. I mean, when I took my political science class, we talked about Egypt. And at the time, this was, uh, what, uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, the time we discussed Egypt, and my teacher said that the president of Egypt, although he has power and he can do things, he's surrounded by a group of people that give him his information and tell him you know, his appointments and his briefs and all that kind of stuff. So again, he's subject to information control on a, you know, on a whole other level. And so by that, she said that he's only able to make certain decisions within parameters he's given. So he is controlled, and his... You know, he might not be given the uh, Egyptian public the truth at the time, but that may well be because people aren't being within his circle, aren't being honest with him, and he's being manipulated. The second possibility is Obama's just a complete buffoon and doesn't really know, doesn't know much about industrial disasters or radiation or nuclear or any of these things, and, you know, he's just a complete buffoon. And that's, that's not, we don't need that kind of president either. We need one who's concerned and attentive and up to date on these kind of situations. And the last possibility is completely in on it. He knows exactly what's going on. And, and although this has not been proven, and, and, and to be honest with you in the FOIA documents, there is no direct link to Obama. And I'll be perfectly clear on that, and I always have been clear on that, because I've seen some articles that were very sketchy where they were trying to imply that he's basically, you know, saying he must say something or implicate himself. Well, that's not the case. They're very careful to... Keep the the highest, at the very highest level of the executive office, the president office. They've covered his tracks well. If you notice the press conference that Obama gave, uh, this would have been during the first week before he took off to South America. Incidentally, when the worst of the plume and fallout hit, he came out and made a statement that, according to the NRC and other experts, that we really had nothing to worry about. Radiation of any degree was not going to reach the West Coast. So he's very careful to clear himself of any possible loose strings or any ties to him. But within the documents is contained evidence of this grand conspiracy. I mean, there's multiple agencies involved. And even before this nuclear incident, you see they've already got their plans in place what to do if in the event there is an actual incident. So to keep in mind, these things don't just happen willy-nilly uh, like Indiana Jones, we're going to play it by ear. They've got a game plan pre-prepared. Now, recently, as I was looking in the FOIA documents, I came across the Comanche Nuclear Power Plant Emergency Guidebook is basically what this thing is. And in the guidebook, there's even a flow chart of how the information goes, from what they determined in the field after an accident to the levels, the seriousness of the accident, particulars of the accident. It's all routed through informational channels. It's distilled. It's censored. And, in, and, and what, what their information is, it's quite different than what the American public is eventually told. It's two startlingly different stories. And I, I expose this quite well in my Tales from the Script series where I pull from the documents and I show you how they, their talking points is a good example, how they're given a preset of talking points and the questions and then their answers to the question. And one, one set of answers is for the you know, experts with the NRC and the others for the general public. And one will say that they'll, you know, when during a meltdown, the general public's response will be during a meltdown, there's nothing to worry about, there's really no discharges, and it's very innocuous. In the one for the experts, NRC, it says radiation may be released and all this kind of I mean, So there's two totally different levels of information. And, and also besides just the whole organized, orchestrated, working together to obfuscate from the American public the fact that they knew about the radioactive plume and fallout. Now, this 
wasn't the first meltdown this planet has obfuscate from the American public the fact that they knew about the radioactive plume and fallout. Now, this wasn't the first meltdown this planet has seen. In fact, there's many more than you would believe. There's Semi Valley and some others that have been suppressed, saltwater reactors that have been suppressed. But the big ones, and the third big one, Fukushima, obviously, the two before that, the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. In each of these prior instances, a plume and a radioactive discharge is released, and people are affected. Now, in Three Mile Island, of course, DOE and the Three Mile Island authorities deny there's any discharge, but there's settlements for over a million dollars to a family with Down syndrome or some kind of uh, a defective birth defect. So we know that this is a fact. In Chernobyl, there's a great study out called Cost and Consequences of the Disaster to the Environment and Mankind. I think that's the title. It's a long one. And it's a, it's a very well done study. It's very complete, very thorough. The methodology and, and, and the answers and the results of that study are congruent with the recent study since the accident in Fukushima that uh, Mangano and Sherman, Joseph Mangano and Jeanette Sherman study. So there's two studies done now that are very reliable studies. Now, they're, they're not establishment studies. They're independent. One thing I want to stress is when you begin to investigate into these kinds of incidences, there's, like I say, there's two sets of information. There's what you're going to find as an independent researcher with an unbiased open mind trying to find the truth. There's another group of information that is put forth and heavily promoted by moneyed interests. Okay, and these are promoted by the quote unquote shills and the quote unquote trolls. All these terms are new to me. You know, prior to me getting this laptop about a, a little over a year ago, you know, I had no idea what a troll was. I didn't know what a shill was either. A troll to me was something out of Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid and we played the role-playing game and you fought the trolls with your wizard and your fighter or whatnot. So a lot of this is new to me, but I catch on pretty quick. So that's the basic premise, too, about the information control when it comes to these disasters and these cover-ups, you know. And as you all are probably familiar with a number of cover-ups from Roswell to 9-11 to any of them, the information gradually leaks out later and over time, you know, 10 years after 9-11, NIST is releasing footage and people can really say, hey, you know, they were, you know, suppressing stuff. We probably needed this information early on to really have a proper judgment as to what happened in 9-11. So Plumegate is a massive conspiracy amongst alphabet agencies and elements of the White House to keep from the American public the fact that this radioactive plume and fallout was headed for America. And there's, in fact, the Pacific jet stream that runs from Japan straight over here that the airline pilots, commercial airline pilots, jump on that airstream and catch a ride back and save fuel. So they already know there's a jet stream coming this way. They have two prior instances. Even if you remove the FOIA documents and say they don't even exist, I mean, you have every reason to start hauling people's butt into court because you've got prior instances. They know exactly what happens. And even in the FOIA documents, like I say, they even refer to Chernobyl, say we know we have studies from Chernobyl. We'll model off of Chernobyl uh, information that we have. So Contrary to what the trolls and shills and nuclear apologists have been saying, in the FOIA documents, one of the big revelations is they talk about the effects of Chernobyl all the time, just like you and me would talk about you know, going to a ball game or something. It's like common talk. So they know full well about the effects of Chernobyl. Now, how does this affect Obama and his, or how could this have affected Obama and his election bid? Because, again, I say, had the alternative media done its job, you would have heard nothing but about Plumegate this whole summer long. It would have been the blockbuster, bigger than Fast and Furious, bigger than Iran-Contra, bigger than Watergate. The death toll now, the study I saw a few months back was at 40,000, and they determine that by the per capita uh, death rates. And they look and see prior weeks, prior to the event, and then weeks after, and you see a rise in the mortality rates. And, and I was reading a figure earlier, like 110 to the power of 9 chances that it would be a random event. So just like in Chernobyl, and there's a bird study too, you really got to dig in because again, the moneyed interests can afford to hire scientists to tell you whatever they want. <clears throat> they can afford to own foundations and have all these websites and these propaganda outlets. So it's very difficult 
as Alan Watts says, to cut through the matrix. So it's critical that this was revealed this, this summer because the documents began to be released in late June. And by February 27, the, some of the worst damning evidence was out, the thyroid doses to children in California that they knew about and talked about. Those documents came out in February. And it's true they did blizzard the documents for those 50,000 pages, over 50,000 of lots duplicated, the pain in the butt to go through. But well worth to get these little nuggets that are so damning and show the huge conspiracy that you know, Jed Hoover said that the, you'd be handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous you can't believe it exists. And that's, that's basically what I came upon. So as I had cognitive dissonance too. It was very difficult for a long while for me to really come to terms with, first of all, that in Plumegate they would conspire to conceal the effects of this radioactive plume and cloud and you know women and children are out in the street and football players are practicing and meanwhile and if you look at really dig into the studies the plutonium rates are 50 times higher than cold war bomb testing so we got dosed on a number of levels not just cesium and not just iodine which are the two common elements they search for right but they don't last long the half-life is relatively short you don't want to test them for plutonium because it's around a long long time and people really get mad so when you look at the implications of Plumegate, I mean, maybe now you're really beginning to understand if this is new to you. It is this dynamite, dynamite cover-up and conspiracy. I mean, it took me a week. Me and my mom and my wife just did circles around here for a week. I was shocked. I was stunned that anyone would, you know, on that scale hide something like that so dangerous from the American public. I was still naive to a certain degree. So... It's critical that this had been exposed this summer and, and you know, and the alternative outlets could have posted up and, and showcased it. They could have highlighted and really brought attention to it. Just like I say, if you look at Iran-Contra, if you look at Watergate, any of these other big affairs, they really get the press. But then you, again, you have to ask, why is that? Why did they get that level of attention? So there's two camps of thought in the world and some are the coincidence theorists and others are the conspiracy theorists. And one of my favorite authors, William Cooper, Bill Cooper, you guys know him, is famous for a lot of things. But he, he said that he believes the whole world is like a game of chess being played out. There's nothing that really happens by accident. I mean, on a small level, maybe in your hometown, there's something organic that, you know, some event transpires, a guy robs a bank or something like that, and it's, it's not contrived and totally organic. But on a larger scale, when you begin to look at the world as a whole and the, the moneyed interest and the power that these moneyed interests have, you have to begin to think like they think. And again, I say control of information is paramount. You are not going to take over the world. You're not going to control the world. The world is not going to be your oyster unless you control the flow of information. And, and it's not just going to stop at the mainstream media, if you think about it. It doesn't logically make sense that they would say, well, let's infiltrate the mainstream media, put all our agents in there and control that, but we'll give them the alternative media and we'll give them the independent media and we'll let them talk amongst themselves and we'll leave them alone. Okay, now that just doesn't make any sense knowing what we know about the mainstream, about the original Operation Mockingbird and the premise of that. Why is that, that is done to control information and make the corporations appear favorably in favorable light to the uh, public at large. So we've got a few minutes left here, and I'm tired of my voices. I actually played a little guitar today and sang on my 12 strings, so I haven't done that in a while because I've been cranking out videos and trying to get this word out there before the election because I know there's not going to be a, all of a sudden a big you know, burst upon the scene of Plumegate and the NRC for you documents and how that affects, should affect Obama and his re-election chances, but I want a record there so I can say people look back and say, hey, this guy was back in February talking about this. This guy left a record, documented, screen captures, facts, dates, times, everything that happened to him, and he was saying something, and later my hopes are people will go back and look and say, you know, put two and two together, it makes sense. You know, things are starting to, the only piece of the puzzle really that makes sense is that there would be a a massive infiltration and indeed damage control, information control when this, you know, terrible damning cover up was exposed in the FOIA documents. That's just logical sense. And the very fact that it didn't explode on the scenes. I mean, if you've seen my videos, you know I'm 
you know, harping on them about talking about the Fukushima disaster, but they won't talk about what's contained within the documents and the size of the conspiracy. I mean, it's the one that Hoover talked about. It's the one JFK talked about. It, it is true. It's, it's very real. There really is a giant chess game being played out. And the conspiracy is, is vast. It is vast. And these agents are, in my opinion, I'm going to finish up here real quick. You know, they're, it's, it's larger than you tend to think. I'll put it that way. It's much uh, larger of a conspiracy than you tend to think, and it's, but it's very sublime. Again, when you're talking about the people who are watching mainstream and believing every word they say, that's one crowd. And the second crowd is now an alternative because they know something is not right. So it just makes sense you have a more sublime infiltration of the alternative and the independent media, some element. Again, not everyone's a troll, not everyone's a shill, but I say in order to suppress something as large and monumental and grandiose as the NRC FOIA document, Clean Gate, Cover Up a Conspiracy, something is, has to be in place. Something's not right. Okay? It didn't transpire the way the alternative media was supposed to be an alternative. It's supposed to be different. I had high expectations, but then I found out it's simply not the case, and there's some things you can talk about and some things you really don't talk about. And that is a fact, and you need to pay close attention to what they won't talk about. Now, I'm going to come back in the um, ensuing night, and I'm going to go into greater detail. We'll talk about the protocols of Zion and how that comes into play. We'll examine some of my articles. Maybe I'll read to you Operation Mockingbird-style alternative media infiltration because I spell it out in logical format, right? And I didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, the alternative media is corrupted. You know, certain things had to happen one after another until finally I'm scratching my head saying, it's the only piece of the puzzle that fits. Back to Bill Cooper before I go. He said in one of his lectures, he says, um, when you put the aliens in there, it answers all the questions, every one of them, he says. Okay, and reading his book, you, you really know what that means when he says that. It answers all these crazy questions that he's, you know, brought up in, in so writing his book. And that's what I say with my contention with the uh, Operation Mockingbird infiltration of the alternative media, right? It's basically the same thing uh, with the alternative media. And, and keep in mind that, you know, if we can expose this and put shed light on it, that's the only way things are going to change. That's the only way things are going to change. If people talk, people get involved, people open up a YouTube channel, WordPress blog, you can do it for free and start getting the information out. The fact that these mainstream and alternative are so controlled, in my opinion, and I'll offer further evidence during the ensuing weeks here, I mean, that's why we have to step up. You are going to have to get involved. Good people are going to have to get involved for before. Maybe you could lay out. Maybe you didn't have to. You can enjoy the ball game, drink beer, go to a movie, have a good time. People got to start to commit some of their time to changing this world. So that's my broadcast for tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you'll join me in the following days, and we'll, we'll cover everything in great detail. I'll leave nothing out, and it's basically a documented record as well. It's like a uh, um, testimony, recorded testimony, if you want to put it that way. So I appreciate it. This is Patrick Penry, and uh, over and out. I'll see you later.